it, the Bitcoin is really smashing two amazing concepts together. It's taking digital currencies and their divisibility. Because digital currencies are just numbers sitting in a computer, you can break them into any units you so desire, as small as you want to make them. But it's taking that and combining it with something like the scarcity of gold. As I mentioned, you can only ever make 21 million Bitcoins. That's the maximum amount. We'll reach that in 2140. And so over time, they become much more valuable. But what we can do is simply just break them into smaller and smaller into smaller units. So right now, the price of a Bitcoin is hovering around $100. And a couple of years back, it was hovering around $4. A couple of years back, it was hovering around five cents of Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin consistently has become more valuable. But I'm still able to conduct commerce because a year ago when I wanted to buy something with a Bitcoin, if it was four dollars, I would use one Bitcoin. Today, I would use uh, 25 divided by four. So it kind of gives you it kind of gives you an idea of of how we can deal with this kind of currency. You can just break it into smaller and smaller units so it's okay for it to deflate in value. And it gives you an incentive to actually save as opposed to every other currency in the world, which is basically get into debt as quickly as possible, spend as much money as quickly as possible because your money's worth more today than it will be tomorrow. If you've ever sold anything on eBay, and you've used PayPal, you can understand the incredible frustration of a chargeback. So let's say that you sell collective plates, collectible plates, and they're of John Wayne. And you, you've been doing this for years, and you really love John Wayne, and you have all these wonderful plates. And so somebody, John Wayne Plate Lover 17, buys your plate, and you pack it up real nice, and you send it to John Wayne Plate Lover 17, and you get a confirmation email saying, yes, that person received the plate, and everything seems fine. You were paid on PayPal. And then suddenly, a month later, get an email saying that the buyer requested a refund because he never received the plate. Now, you know you sent it. You have a delivering confirmation. Let's say for the sake of the argument, you even have a signature. So you contact PayPal and say, well, wait a minute here. I sent that plate, and you show them all the evidence. And then PayPal says, eh, we're kind of a consumer-friendly business, so we're just going to refund the money. So now here's what happened. You sent your product to a person and that person defrauded you and there's nothing you can do about that. So some chargebacks are legitimate, a lot aren't, and it's an incredible frustration for merchants. Some credit card chargebacks can occur three months after purchase. The Bitcoin, once you've given someone a money, it's in their wallet. You can't reverse it. And you can contact them if you know who they are and send them an email saying, Blah, go ahead and please give me a... Uh, Go ahead and please give me a, uh, uh, my money back. And if they're a nice person, they can say, oh, okay, I'll give you your money back. But for the most part, it's up to them. So it's a kind of a beautiful thing if you're a merchant uh, that you don't have to deal with chargebacks. But it also it's a double-edged sword if you're a consumer um, that buyer beware. If you spend money, sometimes your money may not come back. So you have to be a little bit more careful than normal currencies. Accounts can never be frozen by a government. That's really a cool thing. A friend of mine was investigated by the Securities Exchange Commission, and eventually he won the lawsuit. But in the meantime, uh, his accounts were frozen. And for about a year and a half, even though he was a millionaire, he had to live off of about $5,000 for that 16 months or 17 months. And he didn't have enough money because his accounts were frozen to hire a competent counsel. And luckily his brother, who was a lawyer, represented him. But if not, he'd have to have a public defender. And this was part of the government's tactic. They said, well, freeze his accounts so that he has no money and can't defend himself and will have to have mediocre counsel. Um, certainly, the governments also can have legitimate freezing of accounts. For example, freezing Al-Qaeda accounts or freezing drug baron accounts. But it, you're really going to have to have a lot of faith in the judicial system and the criminal system to go ahead and believe that they're always going to use that power for good. Uh, for the most part, you cannot freeze a Bitcoin account. The government can say, turn your Bitcoins over or don't use them. Uh, somebody can destroy the computer that holds the address for the Bitcoin, rendering them unusable for everybody, not just you. 
for the most part, no one can interfere with your Bitcoins. If you own them, they're in your account, you must consent to not use them or to get rid of them. And the last thing is sending Bitcoins to somebody. Once you understand how to do it, which actually isn't that hard, is remarkably simple. It is so incredibly simple. It's basically like sending an email. You just enter an address, click a button, and bang, they've received their money. No bank has to be involved. No other party has to be involved. It would be as simple as you seeing me on the side of the street, walking up to me, opening your wallet, pulling out a $20 bill, and handing it to me. In fact, to further belabor the analogy, I am actually sitting in a dark room, you can't see anything, and you slide the $20 bill underneath the door. That is basically how a transaction works. You're just taking something that we know to be yours and handing it to somebody else, and then the entire Bitcoin network instantly knows, well, very quickly knows, within an hour, that you've done that. It's very cool. So who controls this? How is it controlled? It's very difficult for people in the financial industry, much less in, in the public as a whole, to kind of wrap their mind around a decentralized currency because the first question you always ask is, who's behind it? Who regulates it? Who's in control of it? For the most part, it's like asking who controls a torrent. There's the person who may upload the file to begin with, but once you have a torrent cloud and everybody's downloading the file, no one person controls that. It's a, it's a group of peers talking to each other. So in essence, as a peer-to-peer -peer system, the entire network has to agree on the rules beforehand, but once it's done, you can't undo it. So the Bitcoin is autonomous now. If all the people who created the Bitcoin if Satoshi disappeared, the Bitcoin Open Source Alliance disappeared, but people were still running the software that was developed, the Bitcoin would continue to live. We could have one half of the entire world population die, and Asia and Africa become radioactive wastelands filled with flesh-eating zombies. And even in the event that that happened, this, this terrible radioactive zombie apocalypse land, if even two computers were running the Bitcoin software, they would be able to trade the Bitcoin between each other, and they would not need any additional help. It's a peer-to-peer -peer system. Therefore, no one entity controls it. No one ever can control the Bitcoin. It's not regulatable in a traditional sense, and it's not controllable in a traditional sense. It truly is just like the internet, out of the hands of any one entity, nation, party, or person. So, of course, you'll be asking, well, why the hell is a Bitcoin worth anything? So let's go back to our money. Why is money worth something? Well, it's because people are agreeing to do stuff for you with Bitcoins, and people are also agreeing to give you things for Bitcoins. Believe it or not, there exist exchanges where you can trade Bitcoins for money, but also there exist places where you can sell, uh, you can exchange your Bitcoins for goods and services. So... Think about supply and demand, and think about what people are willing to exchange for in terms of goods and services. This is how you price a currency. So the reason why the U.S. dollar is worth so much in comparison with third world nation currencies is that there is a tremendous demand relative to supply for the dollar. And most of the world is willing to exchange goods and services for the dollar. When you go to China, you will find many vendors who actually accept the U.S. dollar as a currency. It's kind of amazing to be in a different nation and have the, the money of America still be used there because there's such a demand for it, and therefore the U.S. dollar is worth a lot. In terms of the Bitcoin, every single year we have seen a dramatic increase in the amount of vendors willing to accept the Bitcoin for goods and services. Another reason why the Bitcoin is worth something is it's a pricing mechanism for two particular things. First off, it's a pricing mechanism for the fear of governments being involved with currency. That Zimbabwean $100 trillion bill is a terrifying prospect for some people. And that intrinsic fear that some people tend to have about governments and how they conduct their financial affairs is priced by the Bitcoin in some part. Also, the notion of anonymity, privacy on the internet, to be able to move money around that can't be frozen, to be able to be anonymous on the internet, protect yourself from inflation or outside manipulation. That is another mechanism, and the Bitcoin is actually pricing these things. 
So the non-affiliation with the government, the, the distributed nature, its resistance to manipulation and inflation, these kinds of things actually give the Bitcoin intrinsic value that adds to the value natural supply and demand and what people are willing to exchange for it in terms of goods and services do. Last thing is, as more people use the Bitcoin for goods and services, it's going to increase in value. When I invested in Bitcoins, Bitcoins were several dollars. And I was incredibly happy when I watched the Bitcoin go all the way up to $266. It was kind of an amazing thing. It was very surreal to see it achieve that kind of value. Now, is that value sustainable? Nobody really knows. Yet what we do know is as a deflationary currency that becomes more scarce over time, proportional to the amount of people who invest in it, and as more people use it for regular goods and services, and as things like Cyprus collapsing or Greece collapsing or uh, the US dollar losing value and people's concerns about privacy increase, the Bitcoin is going to increase in value. Uh, and that's why Bitcoins in a nutshell are worth something. And there's more reasons, but these in my mind are the most powerful, compelling reasons. There's a floor established by uh, a, a disassociation from governments and privacy. And then if it becomes a ubiquitous currency that everybody on the internet tends to use to buy things and trade things, it, the Bitcoin will become incredibly valuable. All right, well, that's all I have for you for lecture one. I've included a lot of links here that I, in my mind are wonderful introductions to the Bitcoin. The first two links, we use coins.com and Bitcoin Me are introductory websites that have some great videos I'd really recommend to watch that kind of give you a, a sense of what the Bitcoin is about. It's similar to my video, I went into a lot more depth uh, and mine is cumulative, it's going to build into other concepts. These give you kind of a rough idea that you can share with people to give them a notion of why the Bitcoin is valuable. Uh, CoinLab uh, is a uh, another website. The Bitcoin Primer is a PDF uh, that's free to download and it kind of gives you a stronger notion of what the Bitcoin is about in a written format and it goes into a bit more depth. Uh, I've also included Bitcoin.it wiki and there's a wonderful FAQ that has tons of frequently asked questions about the Bitcoin as well as a bunch of links to help you kind of drill down. The official, if there ever is an official website for the Bitcoin is Bitcoin.org slash en and this website kind of tells you um, is an aggregation point to help you get the software you need to be able to use the Bitcoin um, and also connects you to many of the community resources. And the final thing I include is an interview of Kevin O'Leary, uh, who is a very wealthy man. If you've, you've ever watched the show Shark Tank, uh, he's one of the sharks on Shark Tank, and he's, uh, he's also a billionaire, and he has a currency fund. And uh, they interviewed him, and he's talking about the Bitcoin, some of the challenges of the Bitcoin, and why the Bitcoin is valuable. So I would really highly recommend uh, going to all of these links on your time when you have the ability. Uh, the PDF is available, and the links are embedded within the PDF uh, and uh, you can always just of course enter them into your URL if you so choose but uh, in any event thank you for listening uh, and I'll I, I'll love to see you in lecture two have a wonderful day